the safest thing. Okay, at one point I thought it was going to be easier if you went next door and presented from there, but uh, we've got it. So welcome to our first physical meeting for perhaps almost two years, one year, nine months. Um, so it's great to, to be back and it's actually just exciting uh, coming here. Our speaker this evening is a fellow of the Institute who studied engineering as an undergraduate at Oxford and then did a PhD at Cambridge University. And since 2008, has worked in a variety of energy-related companies, Silixa, and then a year in Algeria, doing natural gas and carbon sequestration, and then various roles at BP, and is now currently a project manager for, for flotation energy, so working in offshore wind power. So given this background, I'm fascinated to hear what he has to say about tonight's topic, the energy transition engineering our path to net zero. Alex Quayle. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to have to drive this talk simultaneously on two laptops. There could be technical hiccups. And if anyone online uh, can't hear, then um, please please contact Jonathan or so on, and we'll try, we'll try and resolve it. Um, thank you for bearing with us. And it is really nice to actually have a room with some people in, rather than staring at a Zoom screen. Uh, which is what I seem to spend my entire life doing. So I'm excited about the topic. I'm, I'm keen to chat about it. Uh, I, I guess we'll take questions at the end to be fair to those online. And if you do have questions online, you can submit them on the, on the chat window. I think that's right. Uh, Jonathan will kindly pick them up uh, as and when he can. Um, so I've got a, 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 a bit of material to go through um, and I hope to leave some time for questions at the end. I hope you find it interesting. Uh, like I said, is that not going to drive at the same time? Please drive at the same time. Ah, don't do that. Okay. Do you want? Oh, that would be really annoying if it doesn't work. Okay, it's working. All right. Uh, disclaimer: Every presentation these days seems to have one. Uh, these are my own views. They're not the IMAC's views. They're not an answer to the net zero. That is many answers, and you're going to find that out uh, this evening. But what a time to be talking about energy. Um, you know, what is not to talk about? Uh, we've, we've, we've got climate, we've got COP26, we've got numerous cities in the world now looking at regular periods above 50 degrees C. We've got an exploding offshore wind industry, we've got an exploding renewables industry across the piece. Um, but we've also got the downsides of climate change that look like they are affected, by, they are caused by the uh, change in climate conditions that our energy systems appears to be driving. Um, we've got electric cars displacing the entire automotive industry that sat with us for the best part of 100 years. Uh, we've got the hydrocarbon industry facing its own disruption. We've got batteries and we've got Insulate Britain uh, sitting down in the corner there, uh, who I think are, are an interesting sign of the times. So how much is going on? There's an awful lot going on. And it's a really exciting time actually to be an engineer, I think, for these reasons. So Jonathan gave you a little bit of background about me. I shan't dwell on myself. Uh, these are my uh, kind of uh, uh, credentials in the energy sector, if you like. I spent um, 10, 11 years at BP in particular, I guess stands out, where I looked at a range of different energy technologies and how they were affecting the energy systems that we have uh, today, and also the potential for those uh, disruptors to come in and change the energy sector. I actually joined BP because I wanted to be part of the uh, transformation in the energy sector. There I am sitting on a, a carbon sequestration pipeline in the desert in 2009, putting CO2 into the, uh, into the reservoirs, into the, uh, the aquifers, a um, million tons a year we did uh, on, on, on the Insala gas field. It was really a, a big pilot project and it sort of went away, the push to do that. And here we are back again in 2021, and it's firmly on everyone's agenda, and it's fantastic to see. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, I recently left BP and joined a company called Flotation Energy, where we focus on offshore wind, and particular floating wind. That's where I work today. And uh, just mentioning the corner here, I do get involved a little bit in, in um, uh, investment in new companies here in Edinburgh, and that's something I do uh, regularly engage with, with people on. So a um, bit of a, a, a very background, but there we go. So 
Let's talk about energy transition. What is, what is an energy transition? Well, like all good engineers, when I don't know something, uh, I go and ask Wikipedia. Um, so I asked Wikipedia what an energy transition was, and it told me it was a structural significant change in an energy system. Here's a diagram showing a structural energy, a structural change in an energy system and its resulting impact on, um, on I guess, uh, England in this case. And um, you'll notice uh, that I have axes on my graph like every good engineer should, but I haven't titled it yet because I wondered if anybody might have a clue what this was representing. Uh, anyone in the audience fancy a guess? One guess? One guess? Okay. Gas price. Gas price. Gas price is a very good guess. It is, um, it is GDP. Uh, it's GDP per capita in the United Kingdom since 1720. And those online can probably read the numbers on the dates. But if we look over here, um, we're talking 1500 through to about 1700, there's a big kick up. And what is the big kick up caused by? And the answer is coal. Uh, coal displaced the conventional energy sources in England around this time. And the impact on economic growth has never stopped since. Uh, and indeed, um, you, you'd probably call that exponential growth. I think you'd be pretty happy if you wanted that kind of economic growth uh, today. However, uh, that brings some challenges, as we all know. So why do we now need to transition away from it? I don't want to dwell on this. I know it's well covered elsewhere. Um, but on the plot is showing uh, not now the economic uh, growth, but instead showing the um, CO2 resulting emissions from burning all of that coal and other fossil fuels uh, in the, in the um, in the dark uh, flat line. And then the scattered line that starts around 1850 is the resulting change in temperature uh, that we are seeing the global average change in temperature. We all know that that is not sustainable. Um, what we also know, just looking at this as a slightly different lens, uh, is that temperature has changed before and that measurements since 1850 are not perhaps enough to base our case on. So we have all of the data from the folks who dig up um, ice cores and tree rings and all those things. And they tell us and they show us uh, with physics um, that these temperature uh, changes and anomalies have, have, have occurred before, but they've occurred on a, um, oh dear, my slides have disappeared in the room and they've come back and they're disappearing. And I hope that's going to resolve itself. Um, so I think the key message on this chart, really on the right-hand side, not to dwell on it, is yes, we've seen fluctuations before in CO2. Yes, we've seen fluctuations in temperature, but we ain't seen anything like this, and the Earth hasn't seen it for a very, very long time. And if we don't get a handle on this, uh, we're going to be in some big trouble. So without dwelling on the consequences, how are we getting on with our energy transition today? So um, here's our energy transition. We want to move away from these fossil fuels. We want to move to lower emissions fuels. And um, the, the, the energy transition that we are going to do, Irina define as the pathway towards a transformation of the energy sector from fossil fuels to zero carbon by the second half of this century. Well, that sounds like a, a manageable uh, thing to aim for. At least you can shoot at it. So that's a good start. Um, how are we getting on? Well, there's the banner on the right-hand side uh, showing you how we're getting on, beginning in about 1990, um, progressing across. So the red arrow on the right-hand side indicates the percentage of our fuels. This is UK-focused uh, that are still fossil-based. Uh, and the green bit at the bottom shows the percentage of our fuels that are non-fossil-based. Um, we need to do a bit more is the answer there. So that's what we're going to talk about. Well, we've talked about energy transition, but why are we doing an energy transition? We've talked about that too, but we need to be more tangible in our goals. We need to say, well, what are we actually trying to hit? What does our spec sheet for the energy transition look like? And I'll talk a bit about that today. Um, but in simple terms, net zero can be defined as simply zero tons per person of CO2 per year, that, well, per year. Uh, zero tons of CO2. 
And that's a target that we should bear in mind, that net zero. But I think, I think it sounds very simple when you say it like that. And I, and, I, and I wanted to do that because I think it's very important that we, that we remember the simplicity of what we're trying to do when we get into all these very complex conversations about what technology can achieve what and how many emissions we get from here and so on. And I'll touch upon that um, in the presentation. But hold on, that's where we want to get to. So where are we right now? Let's have a look at that. So here we are in the UK and we're host of COP26 and we can happily uh, show that you know, we are decarbonizing, which is fantastic news. It's over there on the right hand side and those are our emissions, our greenhouse gas emissions and they're dropping nicely from when we first said we were going to decarbonize. So that's great news. Um, uh, off we go down the emissions track. We've still got some work to do. So what do we need to look at? We need to look at our transport systems that's our dominant source of emissions. Uh, good news there, of course, and we'll come to it. Uh, we need to look at our energy supply systems. We need to look particularly at electricity and um, how do we get that? And also how do we get heat and things like that? We need to look at those things. Uh, we need to look then at a smaller board of other things. We need to look at residential. We need to look at business. We all hear about the cows all the time. Um, my friend who's a farmer actually explains that some of these models are really based on uh, fattened up um, uh, hormone driven cows and not perhaps our own uh, gentler beasts. Um, so don't know if that's quite where we need to look straight away. But anyway, uh, we've got a bunch of things to look at. But aren't we doing quite well on reducing our emissions? Well, that's part of the story. There's another part of the story. Sorry, I should step back and just add I did calculate this to be uh, about six and a half tons per person. And I wanted to bring that back because we talk about millions of tons, hundreds of millions of tons. What does that mean to anyone? You know, if I told you this room weighed, I don't know, a thousand tons, what would you do? What would you, what would you know about it then? You wouldn't, you wouldn't have uh, any real idea of what that meant in physics to you. Six and a half tons, let's see if we can relate to a number like six and a half as we go through the discussion. But what about this law? <coughs> so, so here we are ticking away nicely, reducing our emissions and getting down towards zero and we'll hit net zero at some point very soon. Aren't we doing well? Um, and then we look at actually what's really going on uh, and we're perhaps not really changing a huge amount. Um, and I think this is the first thing I really wanted to, to you know, this is one of the reasons I wanted to, to discuss this today, uh, particularly with engineers, because I think that the point of engineering is you know, for, for ourselves is to, is to be the people who take the theory, who take the, um, the, the abstract and we make it real. That's what engineering is all about. And if we are looking at these numbers and they are abstract to us, and it's so many um, cars and so many planes and that kind of thing, what we want to understand is what's a tangible way we can understand the problem and how can we address it? We can't do any of that unless we've grasped what the real challenge is. And I think this graph shows it nicely. This is actually from the UK government. And I'm sorry if you can't read the numbers, but what it tells you is that we, instead of having an emissions today of around 450 tons, uh, million tons uh, of CO2, we have around 700, uh, if you account for what we call exported emissions. And of course, that means imported goods, um, which contain inherently higher levels of carbon than things that are produced here, typically. And if we look at what those things are, um, well, this is not perhaps a fair reflection of the overall piece, but one of the, the biggest country that we import emissions from is China. No surprise to anyone if you look at the picture which is taken uh, in China. Um, but if you look at what we're buying, it's things like our number one imports in 19 were telecoms and sound recording equipment, which I think means these things. Uh, so it's a significant impact that they have on the world around us. And if we really want to get to near zero and we really want to do this as a, a whole a whole sum piece, then we need to look at those emissions and we need to think about how we can reduce them. And there are ways engineers can have an impact on that, which I'll come on to. So, okay, we've added on our real emissions and now we're looking at something like 10 tons a person. Well, 10 is a nice round number. We can get our heads around it but it's also a very, very big number. Um, and if I asked you to move 10 tons of anything, 
I think you'd be quite, uh, you'd, you'd be struggling without some serious mechanical means. Um, and that is what we're looking at now in terms of moving our emissions and displacing our emissions. So how do they come about? Well, we've touched upon it and I'll touch upon it again as I break down each one of these major sectors. Um, but I think this is an important message in itself for us to take away as engineers. Um, and I think we, we ought to be able to get across to people that this is how, this is the shape of our emissions today. And actually, I think if you talk to most people, they don't know this. Uh, they don't know how our emissions break down. They don't know that they've got 10 tons per person and they don't get that message in a consistent and coherent way where they feel they can do something about it. So they don't understand what the difference between recycling a pot of beans is uh, versus um, not taking the car somewhere. And that's something we're gonna have to change if we're gonna meet net zero. Um, what does one ton uh, look like physically, by the way? I just uh, picture for you. So if you take the size of a big house and you um, fill it with uh, CO2 at one atmosphere, that's about one ton of CO2. So it's quite a big volume. Well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, talk about this uh, subject all day, but I do like a good quote, and I thought you might enjoy this one. So I'll let everybody read it while I read it uh, for myself. This is Lord Kelvin, who's a very uh, famous uh, physicist and very famous around here, of course. Um, and what he's really saying is, uh, is this. Uh, he's saying, you can't manage what you can't measure. And so this comes back to the point that I had on the previous slide. And I think that's really one of the take homes I'd like to, uh, to, to sort of really press upon today. Appreciate it. it's very basic. Doesn't tell you a huge amount about BP or the world that we're in in terms of energy. But I think it's tremendously important. Just to, just to illustrate the point, I thought you might find this a little bit amusing. This came across my desk recently. Um, and I think we treat energy and the energy transition a little bit like this sometimes. Um, take a thread and, and go ahead and read it um, if it amuses you. But, uh, but essentially, we, 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 quote, we quote different things in different units all the time. We quote different energy levels in different units. And we don't really do a consistent uh, and clear job of messaging what we're trying to achieve. Well, if that's the case, how are you going to achieve uh, anything? And indeed, when it comes to the um, units of energy, I really couldn't land upon what, um, what we were actually using on a day-to-day -day basis in the UK. Um, this was my uh, quick sort of whiteboard stab at how we get, a, get by on communicating our message about, um, about energy in the world today. You know, if I don't... Um, if I recycle this and that piece of, uh, of, of, of packaging, uh, it's equivalent to not running the washing machine once a week. Okay, well, how does that help me? You know, I still need to wash my clothes. I don't know. I'm going to recycle the packaging anyway. You know, I can't communicate that to people. But if you tell people, actually, the most important thing in, is, is changing the thermostat in your house, well, that's something they can understand. And if they can quantify it and feel like they're knocking a bit off their 10 tons per year, perhaps that's actually a way of engaging people. And as I'll come on to in the presentation, a big part of what we've got to achieve here, uh, and we've got to achieve it through engineering, um, as well as everything else, is behavioral change. So what do we want to do? We want to pick some units that are helpful to us. For today, I'm going to pick these units, uh, which are kilowatt hours per day per person. And I appreciate um, those are not necessarily uh, units that everyone uses every day, but we're all familiar with kilowatt hours, or most of us are, because we pay for our energy in kilowatt hours. We understand there's a unit of electricity in the meter. We put it through, that's a kilowatt hour, uh, and we use one of those a day, and that's a kilowatt hour a day. And if two of us do it, then that's two kilowatt hours a day, and, uh, and so on. And so that gives us a unit of energy that we can, that we can feel, that we can understand. And I'll just touch on briefly uh, how that looks physically. And the other thing we need to measure, of course, is, um, is our tons of CO2 per person per year. Not kilograms that give you crazy numbers, not, um, not, 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 not um, uh, barrels of oil saved or anything like that. We want to get to the heart of net zero and the energy transition. So what we want to do with net zero is hit zero CO, zero CO2 tons per year. 
So we have to start measuring in a unit that people can measure and understand and perceive. And I think that's tremendously important. But what does that look like? You know, what, what does a kilowatt hour a day look like? Um, I guess these are some human scales that I, that I thought would be helpful to put on that. So um, I guess it's, it's self-explanatory looking at the figure. But what I'd like to point out is that um, ourselves, you know, when we're running, if you go out for a run, go out for a jog, you're probably looking at about 250, 300 watts of energy. Uh, and I tried to, um, to pull the rowing machine today, and I tried to pull it as hard as I could. And I managed about 400 watts. Now, I'm not the fittest guy, and I'm not the strongest guy, but I can knock out about 400 watts. You know, most people can probably manage four or 500 watts or so at a, at a, at a peak pace. A champion athlete might manage a kilowatt for a few seconds. So that's the sort of power range we're looking at. And then we look at what machines can do for us. And I think we rather understand how we got into this mess of using a bit too much energy, perhaps. Um, you know, this is, the same, this, is the, this is the same information on a different scale. And now I've added in the car and I've added in the gas boiler. And I think what I'd like you to take away uh, from this presentation, if nothing else, is that that is a huge amount of energy. In fact, each one of us each day uses around five kilowatts continuously. And if you were to put that into uh, something you could conceive, it's probably the equivalent of a rowing eight, uh, an Oxford rowing eight or something like that going flat out on the water 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, uh, just for each one of us. And that is an awful lot of power. Um, and uh, I've put the team of horses there. Uh, one horsepower, I think, is about 750 watts. So again, it's about eight horses. So it's, it's, a, it's an awful lot of energy that we have to find if we want to maintain our way of life. And I think it's important we message this um, and, and understand it. So I guess the other thing to talk about briefly is energy density, because um, we, we, we need the energy, we need the power, but we also need the energy density, because otherwise we can't do things like move around, and we'd end up with huge storage areas. So just understanding on a human scale, what is energy density? So if you run a marathon, you have an energy density of about um, four times that of a horse. So uh, there you go, you're more powerful than a horse. So you have more potential energy per unit mass than a horse. Um, but if you compare that with hydrocarbons, uh, the story rather quickly explains again why we have such a, 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 a great desire for these uh, sources of fuel. Um, they're typically 500 to 1,000 times more powerful than we are on our own. <coughs> so if we think about a kilowatt for an hour, this is a helpful unit to us. So here's a kilowatt heater. I run it for an hour. That's something I can feel, I can touch, I can understand. Just remembering that's still my, my team of horses uh, uh, standing by. But I can start to think, you know, how does that compare to typical things that I, that I like to do? So, um, for example, if I want to make a cup of coffee or charge my laptop, um, fully charge my laptop or charge my phone, how does that compare to what I'm doing there? Well, this might seem incredibly obvious to a room full of engineers, but I don't think it's obvious to people who aren't. And even to engineers, I think sometimes it's a surprise. Um, you know, to look at people, people think about, well, you know, I'll, I'll help to save the climate. I'll switch my charges off. I'll switch my phone off. I will only charge it once a, once a day, or I'll, uh, you know, I, I, I won't leave my laptop charger plugged in. Well, great, you know, save a, save a few grams of carbon. But if you then go and get in the car to go to Tesco, then I'm afraid you've probably wasted your time. Um, so how do we then look at um, other units of energy that we, that we use. So using a kettle all day will be somewhere in the region of two kilowatt hours. Um, turning a thermostat up for an hour uh, by two degrees would give you uh, about two kilowatt hours in a typical house. And if you then uh, were to get in your car and go out um, and it was an electric car, then you would use something like two and a half kilowatt hours to drive from here to the fourth bridge. So now we can start to put into perspective some of these scales and understand what impact different interventions can have on the energy transition. And I think this debate's entirely missing in most of the converse about this, which is why we're getting on for probably halfway through my talk. And actually, I'm still focused on this one issue. 
I'll move away shortly, don't worry. But before I do, let's touch on a couple of other examples just to set the context. So if my car was petrol, it would have instead required 10 kilowatt hours to drive to the fourth bridge. If I turn my heating up by two degrees C and it was for full 24 hours um, and I heat my house by two degrees, that's about 20 kilowatt hours. Uh, and if I were to charge my electric car for however many hundred miles it can do, two, 300 miles, uh, that would be 30 kilowatt hours. So we can start to understand these units of energy. And I hope you're starting to get comfortable with the idea of kilowatt hours and kilowatt hours each and kilowatt hours per day. In terms of our primary energy consumption in the UK, we're typically around 65 kilowatt hours per person every day. Um, and uh, just for reference, I put up there an intercontinental flight would be around 12,000 kilowatt hours. So if you say, well, I'm using uh, uh, 65 a year, and I add that flight in, well, I've significantly increased what I'm, what I'm consuming. So we know what energy we need now. We've got a feel for what that energy is. We can understand that it's a massive amount. Well, how do we get it today? Because if we're gonna transition, we need to understand that first. So what we, what we find in the UK, and again, I'll focus on the UK, other countries are broadly similar actually in, in most respects, um, are that actually 75, 80% of our energy today comes from oil and gas. So we look at the potential of um, renewables and it is a massive potential, I'll come on to that, but fuel usage today is about 75% oil and gas. And you can add to that actually because 18% is electricity and of the electricity about half of that is gas as well. So around 80, 85% of our energy today comes from oil and gas. And again, if we're going to transition away, we have to understand where we're starting from. Um, there is a contribution from nuclear. There is a contribution from renewables. And it's a very important contribution. But this also excludes um, international aviation. And as mentioned, it excludes exported emissions, imported goods. What do we use it for in the UK? Uh, we use it, first of all, for transport. Um, transport is the single biggest user of our territorial uh, energy um, consumed, and about 20% of that is for air travel, essentially domestic air travel. Um, number two is uh, domestic household energy consumption. That's where we use a big chunk of energy as well. Um, number three is industry. Now, when we think about the energy transition and we go out and we look at all the challenges of industry and, and, and changing the, the, the emissions of, of, of big power stations and factories and all this perhaps, that in the UK at least, that's about half of what we, that total is about half of what we consume in our households. Um, and you can add a bunch of transport to that as well, which I'll come to the next slide. And services, we are a service-based economy in many respects. And again, you can add a similar amount uh, as industry. So to touch on transport, um, the vast majority of transport is for domestic and social uh, use, if you like. Um, a certain amount belongs to industry, a certain amount it belongs to services. The vast majority is, is domestic. And this is energy consumed, actually. And this is energy consumed, and it includes uh, flights to some extent. So one of the things we can do to address that straight away is to look at different modes of transport. And um, we, as we all know, the electric car is, uh, is upon us. And if we look at the electric car actually on this, uh, on this chart on the right here showing different modes of transport, we can quickly see that it's one of the best ways of moving around that we have, uh, you know, regenerative braking in addition to all of the energy going to the drivetrain, um, not going out as heat and so on. Um, and then we look at um, we look at what vehicles make those up, and a lot of it in the UK is cars. So a pretty straightforward thing we need to look at is we need to think about changing the vehicles we have. And the good news is that we're starting to look at that. And if we start to think about these emissions again in terms of the totals that we are um, that we are that we are consuming, and I, I try to put these units uh, in place on each um, on each slide that show the sort of lumps of CO2 that are related to this, um, and the um, and the uh, amount of kilowatt hours that we're actually consuming. 
Because don't forget, we're trying to do both things here. We're trying to maintain the right amount of energy consumption, not wasteful energy, but useful energy, but we're trying to mitigate emissions. And we've got to do those two in tandem. So when we talk about one, we need to talk a little bit about the other, because we need to say an easy way to stop having any emissions would be to stop doing anything. But the challenge with that is we need to keep the energy, we need to maintain the activity. So how do we trade the two on? And this is where we need to step, this is where we need to step to. If we look at um, domestic consumption, which is our second biggest bucket, and one of the harder ones to think about, um, actually about 80% of our energy goes into heat in the UK. I guess in Scotland, that's not too much of a surprise, but the amounts are absolutely enormous. Uh, 20 kilowatt hours per day uh, per person, which is the same as a one bar electric fire running all day for everyone in your house. Um, it's about the equivalent of two horses. It's about the equivalent of five athletes as previously discussed. So a big challenge if you want to get after energy consumption and you want to get after climate change and you want to get after emissions and you're in the UK, well, insulate Britain kind of have a point. But anyway, I'm not going to be advocating any action of that kind, but that's what we need to think about. Um, industrial consumption in the UK is, uh, is, is divided, as you might expect as an engineer, um, a lot of process heat, a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, motors and drying and separation and other various uses across the piece. And the industries that we have are pretty um, straightforward uh, sectors. I guess the key challenge though, is this exported emissions that sits, um, that sits at the bottom. If we go to the service sector, again, we're back to heating. So what's the message? If we want to get away from uh, CO2 emissions and we're in the UK, one of the first places to start is transport. And the second place to start is gonna be heat. And later on, you get to things like electricity and electricity makeup and all of the things that people think of first when they think about decarbonization. And then you get down the list and you start thinking about recycling materials and all of those things. And I think this message is missing from a lot of public debate uh, on this topic. And then don't forget what we don't use. <laughs> so there's what we do use and there's what we don't use. This is a US chart, but we have very similar ones. You know, what we actually need is a small proportion of what we consume. And I think the, the, the systems that we have built around us encourage this in many ways. They encourage us not to see the, um, the, the amount of waste that is produced for the amount that we actually consume. And I think that's a big divide that we need to tackle and we need to address. Um, and much of what we need to do initially on the energy transition is exactly address this challenge. So let's come back to where we are. What do we want to achieve? Well, now we've understood a bit about what we're actually using. Now we can start to define what net zero means for us. We know it means zero tons of CO2 per person, but it doesn't mean close down everything, stop what you're doing and, and go live uh, in, in a tent. What it means is, we need to get zero tons per person, net zero, but we need the tools to maintain a lifestyle that people will be happy with. And that probably means something like 80 kilowatt hours per person every day. So now we've got to go and find that energy from elsewhere. And that starts to set some boundaries. It starts to develop our engineer's spec sheet for net zero. I'm not saying 80 is the right number. It might be 100, it might be 50, but we need to put that number in place and we need to say, this is where we're gonna drive from. So what's in our toolbox? Um, all these things you will have heard about, all of them you will associate with the energy transition. And all of them I could give uh, probably uh, a, a two hour discussion on and scratch the surface. Um, so let's touch on some of them and see how we get on. Well, let's keep on the idea that heat is the most important thing we need to address. Um, there's my arrows in the top right indicating the amount per person of emissions that this, that this generates for each of us, for each individual person, by the way, uh, and the amount of energy per person that we consume in Scotland. And now this is, in fairness, not just domestic. Uh, the total there, 40 <laughs> kilowatt hours per day, is the whole um, of uh, all our uh, economy. But still, it's an enormous amount of heat. If I think back to what I was saying, that, um, that just one, you know, one kilowatt hour is that is that one bar fire sitting there uh, burning for an hour. And now I'm saying, well, actually, 
we do that 40 times a day for every person in, in Scotland. That's a huge amount. Um, and it's about three quarters of our domestic energy. The other challenge we have is, of course, we know the condition of our buildings is very poor, but we also know that a lot of people in this country are living in fuel poverty, and that's unacceptable. So what's the problem? Well, fundamentally, the problem is poor buildings uh, and poor interest in buildings, poor maintenance of buildings. It's really quite draw, dry and boring stuff, uh, but it is incredibly important, and it is really where we do need to start if we want to address this challenge of decarbonization. Um, and one of the other things we, we, we should look at very closely is this equation on the right. So, um, so simply put, what are we trying to do with this heat? We're trying to, 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 to increase the temperature, uh, Ti. But what are the things that are challenging us? Well, we need to provide heat, which is H. But what are the things that then convert that H into increased temperature? And the amount of heat you require is dependent upon your temperature difference between inside and outside, of course, Ti minus T0. There's your thermostat setting. So that's one of your, that's, that's probably your easiest thing to control because it's a direct multiplier uh, on the amount of heat that you need. So if you turn your thermostat up or down, that directly impacts this with a linear coefficient. Um, of course, then you've got drafts, uh, which is infiltration, and you've got the, um, the U coefficient of your walls and your windows and so on. And here's an example of what you can do to change that. You can see the building in the middle is, um, is, 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 is a, a zero carbon house, and it does have the same temperature as the other houses inside. You can see that on the cracks on the windows. Um, they haven't just gone on holiday. Uh, but, um, but what you can see is the difference you can make to a traditional building if you really, really try. And I think one thing we need to do is really, really try on this. Um, the numbers at the bottom there give you an indication, just for those referencing later, of kilowatt hours per person per day, and that's per person again, uh, of heat required to heat a standard Scottish home. And most homes are in the categories D and E, uh, and so you're looking at 15, 16 kilowatt hours a day to heat those homes, which really is, is, is just too high. Um, I've talked briefly about this, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of skip this slide by, but just for reference, there is, we, we, we're starting to see some work that really addresses this in a bit more of a, a generic sense um, that people can understand. So there was a nice study I found uh, from Cambridge that explained what are the key drivers that you can, that you can do if you want to impact uh, your domestic energy use. And forget about washing your clothes once a week or or, 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 or turning the telly off when you go to bed and those kind of things. The number one driver is turn your thermostat down. And everything else, how many showers you take, how many uh, hot baths you have, all of that is secondary. And this is the kind of analysis that I think we need engineers to be doing if we want to solve the energy transition. Of course, we then want to talk about supply. So we've gone through demand, we want to talk about supply. If you look at um, the best gas boilers out there today, about 90% efficient. Heat pumps coefficient of performance, I probably don't need to explain that to anyone in this room, uh, what a coefficient of performance is. Uh, the multiplier of electrical energy in, three and a half times that will come out as heat. And where does that heat come from? Well, it comes from the air or it comes from the ground. And what we say is that we're not too concerned about cooling the air um, and bringing the, bringing the air to a lower temperature than it already was and bringing that heat into our homes because ultimately it's gonna find its way back outside again um, before very long, but hopefully not, too, uh, hopefully not too short. But so heat pumps are a really interesting technology um, and they allow us to electrify the heat load. The other thing they allow us to do is be much more economical in terms of grams of CO2 of, uh, emitted for every kilowatt hour of heat that we take in. And that's shown in the charts on the right. So although we put more electrical input energy into the heat pump uh, than we do gas energy into the gas boiler, the amount of energy we get, the, the emissions that we get out uh, from the heat pump are much lower uh, in the yellow there. They are much lower than you get from the gas boiler when you've multiplied through with the coefficient of performance. So the challenge then is that an electrical heat pump cannot be as powerful as a gas boiler. Gas boilers 
as per previously discussed, are immensely powerful things. So what do we need to do? We need to insulate these homes. We need to get this heat load down. And then we need to come in and say, okay, now can I deploy my heat pump? And can I get this heat load that was 50% of our country's emissions? Remember, 50% of our country's emissions in Scotland. And we can now get that down to a quarter of what it was by implementing the right insulation to halve it and then bringing a heat pump in to halve it again. And that is the path that we want to be going down. Another path for, for, more, for bigger buildings is, of course, district heating, and that's widely discussed uh, quite often. Um, and I've plotted on here just for, uh, for information how, how well people do, because district heating is not um, equal the world over. And so I've plotted grams of fossil fuels uh, per megajoule of heat delivered. Um, well, I didn't plot it, actually, somebody else plotted it. I can't take credit for this. Uh, and of course, it looks at different places and different systems, and not all district heating systems are similar. But what I have plotted on as well is a typical natural gas boiler, which is there in blue, and the um, typical heat pump, uh, or kind of best case heat pump uh, using today's technology, which is moving down towards the bottom. But you can go much further and properly design district heating systems that use renewable energy, particularly to power them or waste heat to power them. Then you really can start driving down towards where Norway and Sweden are down at the bottom. Unfortunately, we don't have any volcanoes, so Iceland's a bit far away. And then we come to water heating. So, so 20% of our energy goes into water heating. Well, I did a simple experiment uh, in my kitchen. You know, I looked at um, I looked at my under the sink unit that I put in quite recently to heat up water in the kitchen that I need hot, and I did the same trick in the bathroom where I tried to fill a mug with hot water to the point where it couldn't burn my finger anymore, and I simply read the meters each way, and you find that actually, you know, you look at the way we 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 we, we it's about it's basically a story of using the right tool for the right job, and an indication of how emissions uh, and energy use and therefore emissions. Uh, can be scaled accordingly. So I won't dwell on that, but I thought it was a nice example. So one of the next steps we need to take, and, and the heating comes into this too, is electrification. And it's for that reason we expect electrical loads to double over the next 30 years. Um, and a, a whole range of reasons why we're going to electrify cars, we're going to electrify buildings, we're going to electrify lots of things. And it makes a lot of sense because then we can swap those electrons between different places. Um, and we will increase our electricity consumption uh, to approximately 25 kilowatt hours per day per person. Um, and I have a, a graph on one of the slides showing how that translates between a car and, say, residential consumption. It's really quite striking. But the other thing about electrification that, that is attractive is that renewables are getting much cheaper and they're getting much more accessible. So um, here we have a plot showing uh, cost reduction in solar and wind. And in the last 10 years alone, we've seen cost reductions in solar of 90% and cost reductions in wind of about 70%. So it is incredible. And we're getting to the point, which is shown by the dotted lines here, that um, those costs are now below the cost of running a nuclear or a gas facility, which is very exciting. And of course, in the UK, we're now getting to the point where we almost 50% of our electricity, although it is only electricity, comes from renewables. We still mustn't lose track of the fact that those 80% of our energy is still coming from fossil fuels, but at least for our electricity, we're starting to decarbonize it. And that's a huge step forward. Um, wind power, we know we're rapidly expanding wind power, but what can it do for us? It's a very powerful technology. It's the sector I'm now in. Um, but we also have to be realistic about how much power it can provide. So if you look at the calculations, and, and there's a great book on this, I'll share a reference in a moment. But if you look at the calculations that are available in terms of uh, what, what's possible for wind power, we're targeting 75 gigawatts. 75 gigawatts is an enormous amount of energy. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's a thousand um, jet airplanes essentially. Uh, and we're targeting that to be installed by 2050. Um, from where we are today, which if we look at um, uh, offshore wind today, we're looking at a few of these green dots. They're about one megawatt each. So we've got two or three of them. So we're really planning on scaling this up. But at the end of the day, we're looking at something like 13. Maybe we'll get north of that. Maybe we'll double it. Maybe we'll get 20 kilowatt hours per day of electricity from offshore wind. 
but it won't be all of it and it won't be consistently there. So we'll need other technologies to go with it. Um, but it is getting cheaper and it's becoming more accessible. And if we were to use the price that we have today for offshore wind globally and compare that with our UK electricity bills, we could supply a UK household um, on an average of 250 pounds a year. So the message on this slide is um, wind power is an exciting and novel technology that will help us to decarbonize the UK. It cannot do it all. It cannot be 100% available, but it can make a massive contribution and it can do it at a very, very competitive cost. And I think that's a really powerful message um, for us. But it's also important to remember, it's not the golden answer and we need the behavioral change that goes with it. This is some costs uh, just showing um, how those are trending for onshore, for um, offshore and for floating offshore, which is the sector I'm, I'm now working with. Um, and you see that in the future, we, these timelines go out to 2050. I'm sorry, the numbers are a bit small. But what we're seeing is these costs being driven down and down again as deployment scales. These are still early stages for these industries. Um, and it's very, very exciting. Uh, even if I'm being a little bit downbeat about quite how much it can lift, I think it's important that we're realistic about that. The other thing that's tremendously exciting for us is that batteries, which we're going to use to store intermittent power from these sources, uh, are going to be much, much cheaper in the future than they have been in the past. And um, the electrification of what we do is really a big part of the decarbonization piece. Uh, there are, of course, concerns about batteries and how much capacity we have to manufacture. But I've looked at this a number of times and I've looked at it from within BP and we were not terribly concerned. We were concerned, but not terribly concerned. Um, and I think the challenge here is, you know, this, this brings a different model of operating. And Australia started to discover, they're very proud of their hydrocarbons in Australia, but they're also now proud of having the biggest batteries in the world. And everyone knows about Elon Musk's 100 day battery challenge. Um, they have the biggest batteries in the world and they are stabilizing the grid. And they do more than stabilize the grid by storing power because now they can act with electronic responsiveness. They can replace the dynamic loads that were previously on the grid. They can replace the inertia. They can go from uh, drawing power to delivering power in milliseconds. And this is tremendously powerful. So this is a big part of what we're trying to do. Um, and it's a big opportunity. And the costs keep coming down and they will go down further. They'll drop another half, uh, probably. And if you look at the amount of power we're now able to store, the amount of energy we're able to store in these batteries, it is immense. You, you know, if you think about the fact you might need a battery at home, well, if you have an electric car, then you have a battery at home, and you have a battery with much more power, uh, much more energy capacity than you will ever need at home. So that's an exciting prospect if you start to think, well, okay, I don't have security of supply from my wind turbines. Well, actually, that's okay, because wherever I go, my car is there, and I've got that energy stored. And similarly for municipal storage, you can do similar things. Less excited perhaps <laughs> about solar in Scotland. I did some homework because I keep seeing solar panels pop up and um, it turns out that Scotland's really not the sunniest, uh, the sunniest place, um, which I wish I'd known before I moved here. Um, but it seems that, um, that there's, you can easily access the data online. But the capacity factors for um, solar are something in the region of uh, five to 10% in Scotland. So, and in winter, they generate almost no power. So solar is fantastic. And the cost of solar, I think some of the big energy companies are really worried about solar. And they're really worried about concentrating solar too, because the potential for it in the hotter climes, in the Southern US and those places, it, it is tremendously powerful. It can replace the majority of your energy use with solar panels on the building that you live in, if you live in a building with a generous roof, uh, but not in the UK, so I won't dwell on that. One technology that <laughs> you know you can't get away from in some ways, um, and I'm not promoting it, but uh, I'm not promoting it at all, and, I, and I, I reference here the textbook that I, that, I, that I did some research on here, because I think it's a great textbook to go and do some reading in if you're interested in this topic at all. It sets out a similar approach to some of the stuff I had at the beginning of the lecture, uh, and I think it's really powerful to start thinking about things in terms of the physics under the proposition. This is an old book now. I think it's 10 or 12 years old. But actually, what it does is in the way that a thermodynamics textbook sets out thermodynamics, it sets out energy consumption in the same way. 
and, um, and starts to understand what can these fuels do for us and what do we need them to do for us. And that's the space I think we need to work towards. Um, we can't really talk about uh, all of this stuff and we say, well, look, we've got this huge gap in terms of, um, in terms of what we can get from renewables and what we need. So how do we fill that? Well, carbon sequestration is, is something that people are tremendously excited about. I'm tremendously excited about for a very long time. Again, I started my career doing carbon sequestration uh, and I'm a bit older than I was now. And in the 10 years or so that have gone by, the global um, capacity for carbon sequestration has roughly doubled. Well, that's good news. I think it's great, you know, and, and there's lots of opportunities to store carbon. Uh, in the same time, the offshore wind industry uh, scaled by at least a factor of 10. And I think that is where the challenge comes from. And the reason it's a challenge is because inherently this is a process industry. This is a complex process. It's a thermodynamic process. It needs to be trialed. It needs to be built. It needs to be scaled up. The, 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 the whole thing needs to be built one stage at a time. And even by 2030, the new HINET scheme that was announced uh, as having funding yesterday or, 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 or last week, um, it will deliver uh, blue hydrogen um, on the back of CCS. Uh, but that will deliver something like 30 terawatt hours. Well, that sounds fantastic. 30 terawatt hours, you know, I could go to the moon. Well, that's okay. But if you actually divide it through, you say it's actually about one kilowatt hour, one of those 80 that we need um, for everyone in the UK. But there are opportunities. I wouldn't say don't do it. We should do it. We should look at it. Um, and there are some exciting technologies. I have one on the bottom left here, uh, which is one of those things that needs to be trialed um, over, over the next few years, where you actually have a CO2 thermodynamic cycle and you burn, um, you burn natural gas in oxygen only, and then you end up with a CO2 stream that you can readily inject. Today's technology goes on the back of a power station and you, uh, adds at least 30% of the energy consumption straight onto the power station because it's got to run itself. Well, that doesn't seem like a very clever way to do it. So carbon sequestration has its place, but it's, it's, its place is certainly in the future and it certainly needs a lot of innovation. So I would encourage people to get after it, but I would say don't rely on it as a get out of jail because that it certainly is not, and certainly not in the timeframes that we need to achieve net zero. Um, I think the other one to touch on, of course, and this is, I'm getting towards uh, uh, sort of concluding running through these, but um, hydrogen is a really important proposition as well. Do I think for a moment we should be putting hydrogen anywhere near our gas boilers, anywhere near our homes? Uh, no. Uh, and I don't think anyone ever will. I think it's a great idea to talk it up from a marketing perspective, but it has no real place in, in, in the world. Uh, you can look at, um, you look at the news every few months and you see one of the, or maybe not every few months, but uh, some poor soul once every year or two, their house explodes because of some natural gas accident or something. Uh, and if you look at the um, uh, potency of hydrogen uh, as, 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 as an ignition source, um, you quickly decide that actually that's not where you want to go at all. Um, but it does perhaps have its place. You know, one of the biggest challenges might be long haul aviation. And if you look at um, the demand there, you've got about uh, probably 1500 long haul aircraft at any one time. Each one is 75 megawatts of power, roughly. Um, that gives you a, a global demand of about 500 terawatt hours. Well, if you look at hydrogen as a source of that energy, uh, you've got some problems because first of all, you've got engine efficiency is about 50%. Then you have to liquefy the H2 to put it on the plane. Then you have to generate the H2 with an electrolyzer and you need a total of about 2000 terawatt hours. That's a lot, that's a lot of energy. I think um, it's, it, it gets on towards you know, being significant on the global scale of energy consumption. But the good news is that actually, if you look at offshore wind potential from the IEA, it dwarfs it. So we can do these things, but they are big and they are expensive. Um, by the way, the picture is of a hydrogen uh, air aircraft uh, that was flown in the 1980s by the Soviets. Um, so these things can be done and they do exist, um, but they need uh, enormous investment to make them happen. And finally, I just wanna to touch on this, which is I think a real opportunity for the people in this room actually, because we talked about this idea of having these imported emissions um, and these imported goods. And of course, a lot of these are made with subtractive manufacturing. And we now have a new technology, which is additive manufacturing, which is available to us. 
And I, I pinched this plot from a paper, which is cited in the bottom left here, which you can't, probably can't read the details on, but it, what it's showing is the different ways of getting to the same end component um, with uh, different amounts of energy consumption shown on the bars. So the, um, the blue is the uh, resource production for the materials, then the manufacturing is the uh, yellow, and the um, distribution is in the red, and that's probably shipping. Um, and then you have on the right-hand side of each one of those uh, uh, five um, items, you have the energy required from additive manufacturing. And you see the efficiency is so much greater because now you're only creating what you actually want. You're not taking it away from some great big lump of metal somewhere else. So we look at the, we look at the challenge of the, of the energy transition. We look at that huge lump that sits alongside our emissions and is several tons of emissions per person in the UK. And we start to say, well, actually, you know, if we were to look at what we can do now with our own technology and we can create things that are much more efficient in how they are produced, this is a massive opportunity for us. So I think this is an area we should, we should keep a focus on. Uh, and I hope people uh, in the room and, and online are, are engaged in this. Um, I also mentioned I do investment <laughs> and I'll leave you with a quick, um, a quick summary of something uh, that, that, I, that I looked at um, when I was looking at this in, in, in BP, because I think it tells a story of how investors behave. Um, if you look at the, uh, if you look at, um, the film industry, uh, most people probably, I don't know how many of you uh, were using cameras with filming. They were sort of just around when I was, when I was young, but um, before digital cameras, you had film. And Kodak invented the digital camera and they invented the digital camera in the 70s. Um, and they could never get the funds to go into actually commercializing it and making it work because every time they had a challenge with their film uh, part of their business, it was worth several hundred million a year. And they could never put the engineers into that division. Uh, sorry, they could never take the engineers away from the problem there to go and solve the challenges with the digital camera. And it was exactly the same for me in BP. You know, my job day to day uh, was increasingly to keep the wells running and keep the liquids flowing. And if you looked at the challenges that were there on the other side of the business that we were trying to grow, you know, it was never possible to put my attention onto those things because I was always dragged back to where the revenue stream was. And I think we now look at um, where electric cars are. It's quite clear now that the market is going to move in a material way and it's going to move extremely quickly. In the last five years, every single auto manufacturer has switched. And it's got to the point now where the investors are actually driving the direction of travel. And that is critical. So I leave you to finish the plot on the blue line uh, of where you think electric vehicles might go in the future. Uh, sorry, where, where you think um, combustion uh, vehicles might go in the future if electric vehicles have hit that level of penetration. Um, I won't dwell on this. Uh, I'll, I, I just put it in at the very end uh, as a word on energy security. This is something we want to deal with, not just from an economic, point, sorry, not just from a point of view of carbon, not just from a point of view of um, being good citizens in the world, but actually we have a pretty vested interest in, uh, in, in removing our, um, our uh, dependency on oil and gas. And um, I don't think the way to do it is the way in the bottom left of this picture, which is advertising the, um, the, uh, the barge bringing in the liquefied natural gas from the US. Uh, something around 15% um, of Scotland's energy, I calculated, comes in via that terminal. That's the fourth bridge in the background. Um, what we want to do is get away from all of this, get our dependency on this oil and gas down. And we want to make this energy transition. So that's what I'm rooting for. Um, I'll leave this slide out for now. It's really covering the points, but it, it's there if anyone uh, would like to see it afterwards around the difference you can make. So I'd like to conclude and I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Um, and uh, I hope that was something along the lines of, uh, of interest to those in the room, perhaps not uh, detailed discussions of oil and gas that you might have been expecting, but I hope nonetheless uh, of interest. And I think it's important and I hope you do too. Um, thank you, Jonathan. I'd be delighted to, and uh, thank you everyone for your attention. We will attempt to start pressing some questions and watch the chat. So if, if people want to put their questions into the chat, we'll try to, to pick them up.
Super. Um, would someone would like to, to kick off. Yep. Congratulations. That, that was very, that was very interesting. Awesome presentation. I like the quote from Kelvin. He said, "Measure you. You can talk about it." Um, by the way, I have a number of civil cameras. Um, can I ask you about some other possible sources of energy? I believe that we have to harm all atomic energy. Those columns. What exactly are we doing there in terms of energy? That regards a big international effort. The ITER program. Yeah. The, uh, so what, the, 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 so what, what is it? Could you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, you're asking what they're doing on the um, on. I think it's the nuclear, uh, the nuclear fusion program, really, isn't That's it? Right. Yeah, yeah. I guess um, there's there's a source of energy that 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 that, that is with us every day, which is of course is the sun, and so um, the challenge is, can we replicate what the sun does? And the answer is, uh, yes, we can, but we can't work out how to control it. So I think they're trying to work out how to control it. And um, I think one of the quotes from one of the guys working on it on it was, uh, "We want to we want to put the sun in a box. We just don't know how to make the box." Um, and so it's to replicate that um, hydrogen to helium uh, reaction that can uh, that can um, be a, a tremendously powerful source of energy if we can get it to work. But I think the the danger is that we try and put all our eggs in that basket um, because ultimately, if we don't succeed in distributing power from that. Um, within the timescales that we have, then we won't succeed uh, with the energy transition. So that's what I think is going on there. Yeah. Thank you. Question at the back. Hi, thanks. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to ask you about the carbon uh, sector situation. So I don't have a hair problem, so I just wanted to put some both there. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, so the question was. Yeah, the question was, you're right, you're right. I don't know if you want to try and get the lights up a bit. I, no. I don't know if it's... But um, thanks, uh, Jonathan. Yeah, no, that's not going to work. Well, maybe we'll leave. Uh, carbon sequestration, yeah, that's really all about... Um, uh, of course, oil and gas comes out of uh, wells, comes out of, um, comes out of uh, rocks, and uh, the usual position is that you have the oil and gas capped by a cap rock. I'm sure you've seen that. Uh, in, in sort of geology textbooks, uh, there it is um, with the cap rock sitting and all these oil and gas sits there until someone drills a hole and out pops the gas and out pops the oil and we can harvest that energy uh, for our use. Carbon sequestration is the reverse. The idea is that we take the same place we got the oil and gas from and we inject carbon dioxide into that. And because it's been sitting in that cap rock formation for millions of years, the idea is we can put our carbon dioxide back in there and it could sit there for millions of years too. And therefore we can uh, not worry about it anymore at all. Well, that's great. Um, the challenge is, uh, first and foremost challenge of that, I think, is that um, it's not economic. Uh, ultimately, there's no end product in that for someone to touch and feel and consume. The only end product is, um, is abated carbon and nobody can touch that. So um, if you want to be warm in your house, I can give you heat and you feel warm. And so you pay me for the energy to feel warm. But if I take your carbon away and put it in the ground, you don't feel or touch it, you don't benefit, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't have a, a perception of that. So I think the first challenge is economic and that's why it's never taken off. And the reason that is coupled with that is it's tremendously expensive. Um, you have to, CO2 uh, forms a super critical liquid. Uh, and so you, um, you, 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 sorry, not super, it's a dense phase. It's a mixture between liquid and gas, basically. And so when you, when you uh, come to shift it uh, through pipelines and so on, it's not straightforward. You have to do it at very high pressures. Um, and you also have to make it exceptionally dry unless you want to use specialist materials. The problem with combustion, it produces CO2 and water, and they're actually quite similar molecules. So separating them is not straightforward. Um, and if you have water in your carbon dioxide, you end up with acid. Uh, and so the acid then corrodes the steel, unless you use specialist steels, but then it's 10 times more expensive to build your pipeline. So there's a whole literature on it, and I'd encourage you to look at it. But um, I think a lot of people see it as an answer to our prayers. And particularly, they think the idea that you can, I've seen this on so many models. I mean, you think I'm crazy, but, but um, I've seen this on so many models, serious models of climate uh, that people expect to live through. And what they plan to do is take all of this biomass, 
uh, that we produce and, and, and harvest all these trees and these, and these great sugar canes and then combust it in one of these furnaces that then takes the CO2 and injects it into um, a, a well somewhere. They call it biomass plus CCS. Well, the beauty of that solution uh, mathematically is it creates a negative carbon load because you can, you can grow more and more trees and you can burn them. And the more you burn, the more carbon you put away and the more carbon you abate and the cleaner the world is. Well, okay, that's fine. But we're on this planet where the land is already in use. Uh, these, um, these, these plants that you grow don't necessarily fit into that too easily. You've got all the challenges of getting the carbon out and compressing it and, 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 and abating it. And that's an expensive process energy-wise and fuel-wise. So um, I think there's a lot of potential for carbon sequestration, don't get me wrong, um, but a lot of people see it as an answer to our prayers and it's not. Um, I hope that's <laughs> enough to get you interested in going and finding out a bit more. Yeah. yeah. So can I just ask a question from someone online and then we'll come to you. Um, so some, Adam online has said, uh, you talk about personal choice, but what part do you think policy plays in choice. For example, when gas price metally capped is about a quarter the price of electricity, you know, is that a, a, a government policy that can, can change people's behavior? It, it is, it is. I mean, price, price seems to drive a lot of things, doesn't it? Um, and it drives, it drives behaviors in a way that I guess uh, Adam Smith would, would explain, but, um, but, you know, sometimes feels a bit disappointing, you know, that that's what it comes down to. Um, I think price does matter, and one of the recent suggestions was to move, uh, I guess, um, the cost of decarbonized electricity when they want to have, uh, when they wanted in the past to have a stimulation of solar panels, stimulation of offshore wind industry, stimulation of onshore wind industry. Uh, one way to do it has been to load the cost of that onto everybody across the, across the uh, distribution network. So uh, when you pay your electricity bill, you pay a small proportion. Of your electricity bill towards um, those credits and those um, incentives to install renewable technologies for greener electricity and some of those payments are historic and they amount to a few percent on your bills of course those are the few percent that don't go to the energy company when they charge you for your electricity so they're tremendously noisy about the fact they don't get that five or six percent or whatever the number is um, so uh, so they call it green levies and they jump up and down about it and they create huge noise about it. Well, one of the things that's discussed is maybe those green levies for electricity that is clean should actually sit on top of the gas price and, 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 and actually then drive people further towards electricity and also drive cleaner electricity. And I think that's a fair question to ask. But policy is um, undoubtedly one of the biggest levers. We looked at it in technology in BP, what causes people to change in terms of adopting a new technology? What gets them off their horse and into the car? What gets them off their um, uh, uh, current smartphone and onto their new one? What drives those technology uh, changes? And some of it's innovation and some of it's novelty, but actually one of the biggest drivers is, is policy. Uh, a very quick anecdote, you know, they were trying to get penetration of, um, uh, catalytic converters in the US for many years in the 60s to get rid of um, the, the, the uh, uncombusted uh, emissions and bring NOx down. And um, then they made a policy change that just said in five years time, you have to have this in your car to be road legal. And guess what? Within two years, you went from something like 4% to 96% of cars on the road had it. So this is an, an enormous lever for change. Um, but it's one to use with care because if you rattle everybody, they'll vote you out. And governments, of course, are aware of that. How do you collect CO2 in the real world? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are systems um, where people want to take CO2 out of the air, and that's not very efficient. I mean, CO2 in air is, 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 is scarily high from a geological point of view, but it's about 400 ppm. Uh, parts per million. So if you want to scrape CO2 out of the air, and by the way, CO2 is an end product normally in a reaction. It's not a particularly reactive uh, species on its own. And so you can't easily mop it out with some catalyst. You, 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 you've got to bind to it with some 
uh, chemical, and what's typically used is, is amine, it's uh, a methane, uh, an ammonia compound. Um, so getting it out of air is expensive, uh, energy intensive, and very, very hard. And I wouldn't recommend anyone tries it at all. It has been done, it has been done, but you put an awful lot of energy in to get out a little bit of carbon. And I think you're much, much better if you just go and um, uh, double glaze your windows, for example. Why is there any research and investment on it? Well, I think people see that there are, that, that, you know, there are ways of doing things and things should be explored. And you know, uh, some people will, will, I guess, invest in things and, and, and perhaps, um, well, what can I say? Uh, I think sometimes people invest in things with good intentions and perhaps necessarily without working through the physics of it. Now, I could be totally wrong and it could be the technology that saves us all. But I can't see how something that takes vastly more energy than we consume today, when we already consume tremendous amounts, uh, to try and mitigate the challenge uh, is really the right way forward. I think we've got that electricity, that energy available. We're far better to use it to decarbonize the 80% of our economy that relies on fossil fuels. I'm not saying there's no space for it, um, but I can't see it being a real solution. Of course, capture from the products of combustion, that is a different story. And there you have much higher concentrations. And the cycle I was discussing, the arm cycle, where you have a CO2 working fluid, then you go up another gear because now you don't combust in nitrogen and oxygen. You don't combust in air, you combust in oxygen. And what that does is it gets all of the nitrogen and so on out of the way at the beginning. And so then when you finish your combustion, you just have CO2 and water. So you dry it and you can put it into a pipeline. That's more exciting to me because you're starting to talk about 80, 100% CO2, not, um, you know, 0.4%. Uh, yeah, did I answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Just another one online, and then we'll come to you as the last uh, question. So, um, Liam, online, so do you think there is any potential for decentralized energy grids or our existing policies for focus on energy transition and the existing grid network too big of a barrier for these to be successful. So I think he's asking about the, the grid. Should the grid be more- Decentralized grid. Hugely so. I mean, um, but in the UK, it's a bit more of a challenge. I mean, if you, the, the most obvious thing, I guess, for that question brings to mind in terms of decentralized grids, for, 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 for my understanding, would be something like a, a, a solar plus battery uh, arrangement for your home. Um, if you live in California, then you could have, you know, 10 kilowatts of solar on your on your rooftop. It's going to generate between, uh, uh, you know, it's going to generate north of of 30 percent of the time, probably nearer 50. If it's daylight, it's going to be it's going to be chucking power at you. And then you have a battery, and you have a solution that's quite compact. You 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 used to have challenges with the grid where everything used to need to be synchronized because it was all mechanical generation and you had to synchronize motors, you have to maintain very tight frequency uh, uh, bands. But you can do that all electronically now with power electronics. So there's the opportunity for us. Um, we can have those solutions and they are decentralized and they mean that you have lots of little things that are now modular and can be scaled. Anything that's modular, as any investor will tell you, anything that's modular can be scaled much, much better and much quicker than something that's big and requires enormous investment and is a one-off because that requires everything to go right the first time. And if you have something that's small and modular and flexible and scalable, it can deploy extremely quickly, which is why, for example, smartphones are everywhere because the rate of deployment, if you look back at the history of a smartphone, it is tremendously fast growth, never been done before, um, that kind of rate of growth across uh, distribution of technology. And so that's what being small and modular means. And I think that is, there is definitely room for it. Um, but like I say, don't necessarily bother putting solar panels all over your house here, because I think you'd be better putting that energy, putting that roof space perhaps into heating your water um, with a much higher efficiency gain and much more practical use for you. Um, and then Last one question. question. From the, yeah, uh, what would you say this? Are the calories to keep lowering uh, wind energy? To keep lowering the wind 
You mean cost? Yeah. Keep lowering cost. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good question. I mean, the reductions that we've seen in the last ten years for onshore, uh, sorry, for offshore wind, for for what we call fixed wind, where you where you bash in a a, a monopile. I mean, those are really staggering reductions. You know, you've seen seventy percent reductions over the last ten years, and it's really now at the point where you are looking at um, you know incremental changes in 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 materials going thinner. Uh, steel walls going lighter in terms of structural design, um, but you're really starting to approach the point of of of, of that bottoming out a little bit. I think um, you, you you know, and a lot of the shallow sea is gone as well, at least around the UK. So um, so you are needing to go into deeper water a little bit. So I think that's going to plateau somewhat. Um, there are still opportunities um, around uh, onshore wind, but I think the that they're, they're perhaps um, not as, as drastic as they might be. Uh, floating wind, where, I, where I'm looking now, I mean, that's a new technology. You know, there, there, are, there are five um, uh, or uh, there are units of three or five floating wind turbines at a time deployed now globally. There's, there's probably about um, uh, 30 megawatts or something, 30 megawatts uh, versus, you know, in the UK alone, uh, 15 gigawatts of offshore wind or 10 gigawatts of offshore wind, soon to be 40. So there, I think there's just a huge learning curve to, to, to work through. You know, how can we build things cheaper, lighter? How can we build them in modules? How can we put them together? It's the basics of structural engineering uh, that are going to drive those costs right down. Um, and, and there will be other things as well. I would certainly have a look at the catapult, the offshore renewable energy catapult. Uh, I would look at, at that um, and, and, and see what you find there. Uh, in terms of driving future cost reductions. Yeah. Okay, I think we've, we've had our money's so worth the speaker. Shall I give the mic and I can yeah, please. you for a few minutes? Oh, no, you're great. Uh, <laughs> great. Uh, thank you. So um, when I first heard the phrase net zero, I thought right at the beginning, I thought that's a phrase that's been coined by an engineer. You know, a fanatic would have said zero, but the engineer the, doing the reality check said net zero overall. Let's do something that's let's have a target that's feasible and i think this evening we've had an engineering view of net zero no baby seals no dried up water holes but numbers the numbers that we need to scope the problem and to identify a solution and i think what made this you know such an excellent lecture was the time taken to ensure that we had an intuitive understanding of what these numbers meant i've always struggled with the idea of the mass of gas you know Intellectually, I can see that it must have a weight, but intuitively in my heart, you know, a ton of uh, CO2, I now know is a house full of gas. And I also will imagine the five slaves going flat out when I boil the kettle. Maybe not in the morning, but in the evening, I'll imagine them. Um, other aspects of, the other aspect, I think of this talk that made it so good was the ordering of the facts. There was a moment, I think when you were talking that I thought it was hopeless. It was an insoluble problem. We're doomed, I thought. But you presented more numbers, more hopeful numbers. Electric cars, how small changes in heating could raise the, um, could create really significant savings. And this raised the, the mood. As the talk gathered pace. It became a tractable problem, not an intractable one, a problem that engineers could create a solution for. So let's thank our speaker for both informing us and leaving us with a sense of hope in what was a fascinating talk. So, and uh, last thing to say is we've got two more talks before Christmas time. On the 9th of November, we've got a talk from the Skyrora Space Rocket Engine Company. And on the 14th of December, we've got a, another talk from an Edinburgh startup called Flowcopter who make industrial drones out in Lone Head. So two fascinating talks, 14th of December and the 9th of December. There'll be details in the near future on near to you. 9th of November, sorry, let's say 9th of November, 14th of December. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much and uh, good night to everyone at home. <laughs> thank you, John. Thanks. I think it must have